thanks for coming. Albert Einstein sends his apologies. He wanted to watch the Blue Jay match tonight. <laughs> so he's tied up. So he left it up to us in a series of meetings actually to explain what he think or what he thought about various important issues. We started last week with uh, Chris Mink who gave a talk about general theory of relativity. Uh, it's me now engaging philosophy, Einstein on the method of science. Next week, uh, not from, from here, Doreen Fraser from Waterloo on quantum mechanics. And last, no, no it's not last, actually, the, October the 28th, two weeks from now, when Mirvold, who's here in the audience, on uh, the atomic theory. And then Chris Mink again on the, November the 10th, uh, Einstein's universe. And finally, there's going to be this most likely to be very splendid exhibition of Einstein's papers and writings in, in a satellite gallery uh, for two or so weeks in November and December. So make sure that you attend uh, most of these events, if not all of them. It's going to be like attending a short course on Einstein. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm sure the quality of the talks will be, uh, will be very good. Perhaps not mine, but you'll judge. <laughs> anyway, so tonight I'm going to talk about... Uh, Something that uh, it's the converse of the motto of Rotman Institute, who is hosting the whole event, engaging science, the Rotman Institute says. It's engaging philosophy, a scientist engaging philosophy. Uh, Einstein on the method of science. And uh, I'm going to start with a problem which is a fundamental philosophical problem which goes back to, to Aristotle. Uh, throughout his scientific career, Albert Einstein was sensitive to a key philosophical problem that arises in our attempt to understand how science works and how in particular it manages to reveal as a structure of the world. This problem was first identified by Aristotle in an important, a famous, a significant book, Posterior Analytics, third century before Common Era, and it occupied the minds of most philosophers and philosophically minded scientists throughout the centuries. I call it the problem of the first principles in science. Let me tell you that all the players that you're going to see in this lecture were famous enough to become stamps. <laughs> Only one was not. Unfortunately, you'll see a, a player, a key player who didn't become a stamp, and it's a big shame. But that's Aristotle. And roughly put, the problem is this. Science starts with first principles, which we know, from which we derive less fundamental principles, theorems or empirical laws or whatever. And this process is very nicely understood, it's deduction. We derive logically the theorems or the fu less fundamental principles from, from the axioms, from the, the first principles, not quite the axioms. But how do we arrive at the first principles themselves? Now, we cannot prove them by means of other first principles because we're going to have a, a regress. So it's not deduction that will lead to them. Aristotle thought it's not in our mind, they're not a priori, independent of experience uh, in our mind. Therefore, it must be experience that takes us uh, to the first principles. And actually, he named, he called this process for the first time induction, in Greek, epagogy, the way by means we start from experience, and with a process he never actually described thoroughly, we arrive at the principles from which we start all demonstration in science. Now, uh, a corollary of this, which was uh, a very important to Einstein, was what is the contribution of experience and what of reason in our scientific image of the world? If the ultimate test uh, of a theory is concordance with experience, does it follow that theories are or should be dictated by experience? What's the contribution of reason? What's the contribution of experience? Now, Einstein was always very philosophically active. Even in his most technical scientific papers, he was making important philosophical uh, points and philosophical ideas in operation, uh, but was that idiosyncratic of Einstein's own personality? Shouldn't philosophy be left to philosophers? Are scientists entitled to do philosophy? Now, that's a long quotation is going to follow, but it's a marvelous quotation, how Einstein characterized the relation between scientists and philosophy. It has often been said, and certainly not without justification, that the man of science, the woman of science too, of course, is a poor philosopher. Why then should it not be the right thing for the physicist to let the philosopher do the philosophizing? Such might indeed be the right thing at a time when the physicist believes 
he has at his disposal a rigid system of fundamental concepts and fundamental laws which are so well established that waves of doubt cannot reach them. But it cannot be right at a time when the very foundations of physics itself have become problematic as they are now. That's written in 1936, quite a bit late anyway in, in, in Einstein's career. At a time like the present, when experience forces us to seek a newer and more solid foundation, the physicist cannot simply surrender to the philosopher the critical contemplation of the theoretical foundations. For he himself knows best and feels more surely where the soup pinches. In looking for a new foundation, he must try to make clear in his own mind just how far the concepts he, he uses are justified and are necessities. So I take it that Einstein says philosophy has two kinds of roles or tasks vis-a-vis -vis science. I call the first normal philosophical activity. And it's basically to clarify the conceptual framework that scientific theories use to represent the world. It's an activity which is really in force when there is a certain scientific conceptual framework in place. I take an exemplary of this kind of activity to be Kant's work on Newton. How Kant tried to clarify the conceptual foundations of Newtonian mechanics. What should the world be like in order for it to be knowable in order for Newtonian theory to be true. But there is something which I call critical philosophical activity, and it's to create or contribute to the creation of the very conceptual framework through which scientific theories represent the world. Now, this normally happens when there are, we're in the midst of a scientific revolution. Now, for Einstein, and I think that's a very good insight, the second philosophical task requires the engagement of scientists with philosophy. I call that critical philosophical activity because there is an element of critique of science and an element of crisis of science. So it's critical in this dual sense. Now let's go back to the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, and uh, look at this period, a very fertile period where science was in deep crisis, and scientists themselves, with very few exceptions, were actually very much engaged in philosophy, aiming to secure the conceptual foundations of the new theories. Now, during this period, end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th, issues concerning the, mo the method of science became very prominent. Why was this period very special? Because all issues that we care about when we care about science were up for grabs, were being discussed. Geometry and the structure of space, the atomic theory of matter, the electromagnetic view of the world, Newtonian mechanics and its role in science, and ultimately the structure of matter and energy which led to the emergence of quantum mechanics. I'm going to talk mostly about the first four, uh, more detailed about that, in less detail about the other three. So th these are the stamps. These are quite rare stamps, actually. <laughs> I wish I had them. But these are the three key players in geometry until the end of the 19th century. Euclid the geometry we all care about, the geometry we learn at, 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 at our mother's knee. But in the end of the 19th century, non-Euclidean geometries emerged. Lobachevsky, Nikolai Lobachevsky, a Russian uh, mathematician, and Bernard uh, Riemann, a German mathematician, developed consistent mathematical systems which represent physical space, broadly speaking, in non-Euclidean terms. These are consistent mathematical theories but then they possi possibly describe physical space. They make conflicting claims. For instance, in Euclidean geometry, basically, you've got a point outside a line. You can draw just one parallel to it. In, 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 in Riemannian geometry, there are no parallels from a point outside line, a line. And in Lobachevskian ge geometry, hyperbolic geometry, infinite parallels can be drawn from a point outside a line. So there is a conflict. But it's a mathematical conflict. One might think, why should we care about physics? There were very two influential responses back then. One by a, a German, very famous German uh, uh, physicist and mathematician, Hermann von Helmholtz, who said roughly that the axioms of, an, of Euclidean geometry, of any geometry, are empirical. Empirical generalizations. We can prove them on the basis of experience. Now, a very famous French mathematician and physicist, Henri Poincaré, back in the 1890s something, said this cannot possibly be right. The axioms of Euclidean geometry do not refer to things we encounter in the space. They talk about lines, planes, points. No one has seen a point. No one has seen a straight line, strictly speaking. These are ideal entities 
which the mind somehow constructs or abstracts out of empirical situations like the movement of solid bodies. But if that's a situation, what are the axioms of geometry? Now, Poincaré famously said, they are conventions. They are neither a priori true. Why? Because we can conceive of alternative geometries like the Riemannian and the Lobachevskian. But they are, they are not, they, they are, nor are they empirical generalizations for the reasons that we cannot encounter geometrical objects in experience on the basis of which we make generalizations. Do they characterize physical space in some sense? Now, here's a famous thought experiment Poincaré performed. Imagine we're on a disk. That's a world. It's a flat disk. It's a Euclidean disk, two-dimensional disk. And little uh, uh, people live on this, two-dimensional. They cannot escape from this disk. They've developed their rational faculties in such a way that they can think about geometry. So they try to understand what the geometry of the world they live in is. We know it's a Euclidean geometry. It's a bounded circle, a flat two-dimensional circle. But how would they proceed? They say, we're going to make measurements. And one measurement they can make is to see whether from a point outside the line, they can draw none, one, or many uh, parallel lines. So they start doing an expedition. Many scientists go to this point and they start moving about. And how can we tell operationally when two lines are parallel? No matter how long we extend them, they never meet. So they start doing this, this, this physical experiment, but without knowing there is a very strange physical force in this world. A physical force which somehow heats up the world in such a way that things shrink as they move away from the center of the world towards the periphery. But because there is ideal thermal conductivity, no one understands how things actually shrink. Everybody shrinks as they move outside the circle, away from the circle and towards the periphery. But that, what does that mean? They're going to never reach the end. It's like the Zeno paradox. And besides, no matter how far they try, they're not, never going to make lines like that cross the diameter. So they come to a convention after a few months, and they say, we discovered that the world we live in is Lobachevskian. It's, a, it's an infinite world. It's an unbounded world. And it's such that from a point outside the line, an infinite number of lines can be drawn. And then a young mathematician shows up. I call him Lopernicus. And he says, no, no, no. There is an equivalent hypothesis here. Namely, the world we live in is Euclidean. But nonetheless, there is this strange force, this, this heat, fo heat uh, uh, field, which makes everything shrink as we move outside uh, the center towards the periphery of, of, of the world. So the community goes into crisis because you've got two hypotheses. Uh, one is that the world is Euclidean and there is this strange physics. The other is that the world is Lobachevskian, but the physics is, is normal. How do they decide between them? What Poincaré says, and I think he's quite right about that, we always test geometry together with physics. But he draws a conclusion that Einstein doesn't like at all. The conclusion is, therefore, we can always hold on to geometry by changing physics accordingly. So he says, Euclidean geometry has nothing to fear from fresh experiments. Why, no matter what happens, we can always think of the geometry of the world as being Euclidean and change or modify our physics. Now, that's a key disagreement between Poincaré and Einstein. Now, Chris spoke last week, and he said something really extremely important. Namely, Einstein's theory of general relativity implies that space is not actually flat. Not only is it not flat, it's curved, but its curvature is variable. The curvature of the space varies according to the distribution of mass. So the, the, not only is, is it not Euclidean geometry, the physical geometry of the space, but not even any kind of non-Euclidean geometry with uh, constant uh, curvature. But making this big move to the claim that the geometry of the world is not Euclidean required an important philosophical shift. For Poincaré, the principles, for, for Einstein, sorry, the principles of geometry are not conventions. He wrote a wonderful piece, a must read, Geometry and Experience, 1921, and he argued there that although we can always test geometry in conjunction with physics, we test this thing holistically, which means that we can either change the geometry or the physics. Geometry is not sacrosanct. 
We can always change the geometry and retain the physics. Hence, if there is conflict between geometry and physics, it is geometry that may be abandoned or modified if this gives you a simpler account of, of, the, of the world. So he said famously, according to the view advocated here, that is in this piece, the question whether this continuum, spatial-temporal continuum, has a Euclidean, Riemannian, or any other structure, is a question of physics proper, which uh, must be answered by experience, and not a question of a convention to be chosen on, on grounds of mere expediency. Second big thing, the, the, the structure of uh, the, the, the atomic theory of matter. Uh, until then, 1910 or so, uh, the atomic theory of matter was a minority view among most scientists. Uh, it was mostly the work of this guy over there, a French physicist, Jean Perrin, who got the Nobel Prize in 1921, who actually showed that uh, we've got good reasons to believe that there are atoms. And one way to do that, that is there are molecules, that is the matter is granular, it's not continuous, uh, was the so-called Brownian motions. So you, you, you draw various relatively big particles like pollen particles or particles made by mastic or gumboats into a liquid. And then you see under the microscope, of course you don't see the molecules over here, but you see them, they're big enough to be seen under the microscope. You see this haphazard motion that they follow. And an explanation for this is that they, uh, they hit on the atoms and the molecules of the, of the liquid, and this explains why they've got this totally erratic haphazard motion. This was a well-known phenomenon called Brownian motion because of Robert Brown, a botanist, early 19th century, identified it as a special uh, phenomenon. And the explanation was that it's because of the atoms that we find this uh, strange behavior of these uh, uh, Brownian uh, particles. Einstein did wrote an important paper back in 1905, actually a series of papers defending atomism and explaining the atomic theory of matter and the atomic explanation of the Brownian motion. And all this was very nicely confirmed by experimental work and theoretical work that uh, this guy, Jean Perrin, did in 1908-1910. And all of a sudden, the scientific community shifted towards accepting the atomic theory of matter. I'm just scratching the surface. Wayne is going to talk about that in two weeks' time in great detail. But it's not just that. Electromagnetism. Einstein said Maxwell's theory of the electromagnetic field represents probably the most profound transformation of the foundations of physics <coughs> since Newton's time. That's 1870, 1875, 1880, 1880. But as Chris Sming said last week, there is a very strange thing here. The speed of light. The speed of light is constant. Everybody knew that. But it's not just constant. It's independent of the motion of the source. So that's a very strange property of the speed of light. And this meant something really important, that Maxwell's equations, fundamental equations of how electricity and magnetism work, uh, violated the fundamental principle of physics. They were not invariant under Galilean transformations. Now, what are they? Very, very briefly, again, Chris spoke about that. Galileo, another famous guy, and he became a stamp, actually far too many stamps. Uh, he said somehow that the state of motion, if it's kind of an, if, 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 it's, if it's inertial motion, that is, if there is no acceleration, the state of motion of an observer or a frame of reference should not be such that the laws of nature change according to the motion. So whether you move or not, if, insofar as your motion is with a constant velocity, a rectilinear constant velocity, then there shouldn't be any difference in the way you perceive the laws of, nat of, of, of nature. The same equation should hold. And these are the famous transformations. I don't think they are Galileo's, but they were already known when Newton wrote the Principia. Uh, and it's basically the way we think about uh, uh, how motion relates to uh, our experience in our, our everyday life. But it's, it's really important that this kind, that this kind of tra transformations were violated by Maxwell's equations. And uh, an important Dutch physicist, Hendrik, Hendrik uh, Lorentz, devised a new set of transformations which live in variant Maxwell's equations. But lo and behold, in this transformation, something really strange happened. Time also changes. Time is not constant between the frames of reference. It's not the same. We've got to transform the time as well. So the, there is a dilemma back then. Either the Galilean principle of relativity has to be abandoned or it has to be 
transformed. Now, Einstein, very early on, 1900-1905, the miracle year of the special theory of relativity, suggested that we should transform the principle of relativity. We should actually adopt Lorentz's transformations as the transformations which connect inertial frames, and thereby make sure that Maxwell's laws hold in all inertial uh, frames. But to do that, we had to change our concepts of space and time. Uh, and uh, actually, as he says here, that this is idea that the invariance actually is in all of physical systems which express general laws with respect to Lorentz transformations, not to Einstein's, not to Galileo's, is the key element of the special theory of relativity. But as I just said, to do that, we had to reconceptualize our notions of space and time. So we no longer have absolute simultaneity. We can no longer say these two events happened at the same time. It all depends on the motion of the, of the observer who actually makes the, the measurement. And the same goes for, uh, for, for, for space. Uh, and of course, this is a famous diagram which goes back to another important uh, a German mathematician, Hermann Minkowski, that's not Einstein, how now you've got, instead of space and time, space time with a complicated structure which is clearly distinct from the Newtonian structure of absolute space and absolute time. Finally, Newtonian mechanics. Everybody got back then was thinking that that's a global theory, that everybody should actually adopt this theory and should be the foundation of all processes. All processes in nature should be reducible to, the, 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 to Newton's laws. And, and actually, there's, there's a famous second law. Uh, that's a French stamp uh, for Newton, and that's a bit ugly for obvious reasons. Uh, <laughs> now, the second law says, the change of motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed. Everybody knows that. F equals ma in modern terms. And then it, what turned out to be the case is that instead of actually reducing electromagnetism to mechanics, we had to modify, and Einstein preferred to modify the laws of mechanics and keep intact Maxwell's uh, equations. So the, law, the laws of, of, of mechanics, that is Newton's laws, had to be uh, modified and to hold for velocities far lower than the speed of light. So that's the relativistic momentum, and that's the relativistic formulation of Newton's law uh, with this gamma, which involves the Lorentz transformation, uh, as I noted uh, above. So this was the situation in the beginning of the 20th century, 1905-1910. And this meant that uh, an important philosophical system that was in place back then uh, the system of Immanuel Kant had to actually be reworked, be revised, be reshaped. Now, Kant is very famous for believing that there are synthetic a priori principles, that is, principles which are independent of experience, that is, <coughs> sorry, uh, and therefore necessary, and therefore immune to revision, which, however, tell us something about the structure of the world. They've got synthetic content, as it were. And these, are, these principles are necessary and are revisable and are required for the very possibility of experience and of science. That's the only famous person that ever became a stamp. That's Moritz Schlick. Moritz Schlick is the founder of the Vienna Circle, a famous philosopher of science and one of the philosophical innovators in the 20th century. So Einstein wrote to Schlick. They had an exchange about relativity theory. I, he wrote to Schlick in 1915, truly masterful is your position to the doctrine of Kant referring to doctrine, the doctrine of Schlicks. The trust in the apodictic certainty of synthetic a priori judgments is already undermined heavily if one realizes the invalidity of even just one of these judgments. So Kant was wrong, and Einstein was very uh, 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 keen to, to, make, to make this point. But this actually made the following issue very prominent. What is the status of the basic principles of science? And concomitantly, what is the right method for doing science? So Einstein actually endorsed the atomic theory of matter. And at the same time, he endorsed the special and general theories of relativity. But these are different theories. The atomic theory of matter posits these little things, the molecules, the atoms. No one has ever seen an atom. No one has ever seen a molecule by a naked eye. But nonetheless, by hypothesizing these uh, little things, it explains all macroscopic phenomena on the basis of the properties and the laws of the interactions of atoms. On the other hand, the special theory of relativity 
does not seem to rely on big hypotheses, at least hypotheses of this sort. It relies, as Chris explained last week, on two major principles. The principle of relativity, all frameworks which are connected by Lorentz transformation are inertial frameworks and all laws of nature hold in them. And the light postulate, the postulate that the light has a constant velocity independently of the state of motion of the source and of the observer. Now, what do these principles do? They impose general constraints on the spatio-temporal structure of the world and the laws of motion. So one could say that the atomic theory of matter relies on hypotheses, and the spatial relativity relies on principles. Is there a difference in these two types of theory? Now, within the space of one month, roughly, Einstein wrote two important philosophical pieces in 1919. <laughs> November 28th in the Times, London Times, what is the theory of relativity, and then we'll see it in a while uh, in uh, a German uh, uh, magazine uh, in Christmas of 1919 about the method of science. So in this particular piece where he explains to the general public what the relativity is about, he makes a very interesting distinction between two types of theory, what he called constructive theories and what he calls principle theories. So constructive theories, as he says, are attempts to build up a picture of the more complex phenomena out of the materials of a relatively simple formal scheme for which they stand out. So the example here, to make it clear, is the kinetic theory of gases, the atomic theory of matter, in other words, which seeks to reduce mechanical, thermal, and diffusional processes to movements of molecules, i.e. to build them up, out of the hypothesis of molecular motion. You start with these little, little things, you don't see them, you hypothesize them, you hypothesize the laws they obey, and somehow you manage to explain everything that you see, you observe, you experiment with on the basis of these little things and the laws they obey. The principle theories, on the other hand, he says the elements which form the basis and starting point, the principles, are not hypothetically constructed but empirically discovered principles, general characteristics of natural processes, principles that give rise to mathematically formulated criteria which the separate processes or the theoretical representations of them have to satisfy. The example here is what is called phenomenological thermodynamics, before the statistical mechanics, before the atomic theory of matter, where basically, as he says, uh, seeks the by analytical means to deduce necessary conditions which separate events, which separate events have to satisfy from the universally experienced fact that perpetual motion is impossible. So the idea here is that you start with a principle which is empirically grounded, that there is no perpetual motion, and you use this principle to explain various other uh, laws, the laws of the gases, etc., etc. So there are two different types of theory, and Einstein toys with the idea that there is an epistemological difference between them. He says constructive theories are explanatory, they rely on hypotheses, Principle theories avoid hypotheses, start with general principles and try to explain everything on this uh, basis. And he says there is prima facie a different, actually prima facie is mine. He says there is a difference between them. Constructive speculation, if you hypothesize little things unseen by the naked eye, increases the distance between the foundation of a theory and sense experience. So a theory which posits all these little things to be seen like molecules and atoms, is more risky theory because it's far away from what we ordinary experience uh, by means of observation and experiments. So it seems as though principle theory seem to stay closer to experience and therefore be more certain than hypothetical constructive theories. However, for Einstein, that's not reason for skepticism. Even if that's so, speculative theories can achieve, he said, logical unity and can unify various seemingly disparate phenomena. Not just that, he talked about the kinetic theory of gases, that's in the 1919 paper in the Times. He said what made the, the turning point for the acceptance of this theory was that it produced definite values for the true magnitudes uh, or atoms and molecules which resulted from several independent methods and were thus placed beyond the realm of reasonable doubt. The highlighted words are really important definite values and independent methods. Here there is an allusion to the work made by Jean Perrin, who actually showed that there are 13 different ways or so to calculate Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is a number hypothesized and it's got to do with the number of molecules in a certain volume of a gas. This got to be 
a certain number, 6.023 to the power of uh, uh, 10, uh, 23. But nonetheless, we've got a definite value of the properties of atoms and a definite and, and multiple ways actually to calculate this, this number. So Einstein says the constructively speculative character of some entities is not a reason to doubt their existence. That's a beautiful quote. Nobody could ever hope to perceive directly an atom, Einstein says. Still, we shouldn't doubt their existence because laws concerning variables connected more directly with experimental facts, for example, temperature, pressure, speed, were deduced from the fundamental ideas hypothesis by means of complicated calculations. So Einstein seems to say, and I think that's a good point, successful and rigorous testing of a, the of, of a theory together with the unification of various seemingly disparate phenomena by the theory are sufficient for accepting the reality of the entities posited by the theory. So he was never a skeptic about electrons and, and other elements of the micro microstructure. Actually, he was very critical of Newton. Uh, and he, because he took Newton to be an advocate of, of inductivism, and he said, uh, we now realize with special clarity how much in error are those theorists who believe that the theory comes inductively from experience. Even the great Newton could not free himself from this error, and he refers to hypothesis uh, non fingo. So he was very clear that you cannot get to the fundamental principles by means uh, of experience. They've got to be hypotheses of some sort. Now, the other piece I was talking about uh, it was published a few weeks after the piece in the London Times. It's called Induction and Deduction in Physics in Berlin and uh, Tageblatt. And, and there he makes an interesting distinction between induction on the one hand. He says individual facts are selected and grouped together such that their lawful connection becomes clearly apparent. By grouping these laws together, one can achieve other more general laws until a more or less uniform system for the available individual facts has been established. So you start from the bottom and you go up by individual facts, which you generalize and generalize until you reach some general principles which apply to all the facts you've examined. But he immediately notes that this is hopeless. It's, it, you cannot get to the fundamental principles like that. So he contrasts that. He didn't use the expression hypothetical deduction, which is more modern terminology. He talked about the intuitive method. But of course, we should be very careful because Jean Perrin himself, the French physicist, when he was actually defending his own method, the hypothesis of atoms and the explanation of everything on, 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 it, on its basis, he took this method intuitive deductive. So it's mostly a way to dissociate it from induction, from a direct generalization, so from experience to call it intuitive, not that you intuit the essences or the natures of these entities. And he says the intuitive grasp of the essentials or a, uh, or a large complex of facts leads the scientist to the postulation of a hypothetical basic law or several such laws. From this basic law, he derives his, con his conclusion as completely as possible in a purely logically deductive manner. These conclusions derived from the basic laws can then be compared to experience and in this manner provide criteria for the justification of the assumed basic law. So what he says is that we don't do it bottom up, we do, we do it top down. We start with postulates, with hypotheses, we, would, we deduce observations, empirical laws and predictions, we test them experimentally and if they are borne out then we kind of trust or believe in the truth of this hypothesis. That's the intuitive method, which he thinks it's a method of science as opposed to the inductive method, bottom-up generalizations. But is there a conflict in the two positions? Within the space of one month, Einstein seems to be uh, saying that principal theories are not hypothetical and, and, and they don't involve hypotheses, uh, whereas the constructive theories uh, are hypothetical and, and therefore somehow we should avoid principle theories, as it were, because the method of science should be we start with hypotheses and we derive from them predictions uh, by means of deduction. I don't think there is a real tension here because the principles of the principle theories go beyond experience. They generalize a lot beyond what we've actually uh, seen. And of course, they are hypothetical. They hypothesize that what we've observed uh, as holding in particular cases hold generally uh, 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 equally well. But I think, and I think that's an important insight Einstein had, that they're hypothetical in a different sense than the hypothesis 
of the constructive theories. So it's two kinds of principles and I think two kinds of hypotheses. I call them speculative or vertical and comprehensive or horizontal. I'm not tied to these expressions. I think they can be improved on, upon, but I think one, the idea here is that with a the speculative theory, we dig vertically. We try to find the microstructure by means of which we try to ground the behavior of, of observable things and laws, whereas with the principle theories, the, the principle hypothesis, let's put them, we go horizontally. We extend what we've seen uh, as holding in various good cases to uh, general uh, principles. Now, both are needed for science, both promote unity, both are testable. More importantly, for Einstein, both are creations of the human mind. And that's an important message he wants to send. Science is not a passive taking in of facts of experience, which are generalized by induction. There is an ineliminable active element in science, a contribution of the hum human mind, which comes across when we think of the hypothesis as being freely created and adopted by the human mind and being tested deductively by means of predictions. So although Einstein was in disagreement about, with Kant about synthetic a priori principles and with Poincaré about conventions, he accepted an extremely important aspect of Kant's philosophy. Kant says experience is receptive, experience receives things, but the understanding is active. It's spontaneous, the spontaneity of the understanding, that somehow the understanding has to produce the categories or the general concepts by means of which we view and try to understand the world is a key element of Kant's thought. And I think Einstein was actually in agreement with that. And that's the way he understood this idea of the free creation of the human uh, mind. Now, to say a little bit more about this distinction, in 1918, the 60th birthday of a great physicist, Max Planck, Einstein again gave a talk. He talked again about intuition, uh, that which leads to principles. And he insisted there is no logic of discovery. There is no algorithmic path from what we experience to some principles by means of which we try to understand the world. There is no logical path to these laws, only intuition resting on sympathetic understanding of experience can reach them. And Many, many years later, to see that that's a constant part of his thought, that's 1933, the Herbert Spencer lecture in, in physics, a famous lecture titled on the method of physics. I'm going to read it out. It's beautiful. The structure of the system is the work of reason, the system of science, the theoretical system. The empirical contents and their mutual relations must find their representation in the conclusions of the theory, in what the conclusion says about, the theory says about the world. In the possibility of such a representation lie the sole value and justification of the whole system and especially of the concepts and fundamental principles which underlie it. Do you get experience right by means of that? That's where, and do you get the structure of the world right by doing that? That's the sole value and justification of the whole system. Apart from that, this latter, that is the concepts and principles, are free inventions of the human intellect, which cannot be justified either by the nature of the intellect or in any other fashion a priori. These fundamental concepts and postulates, which cannot be further reduced logically, form the essential part of a theory which reason cannot touch. It is the grand object of all theory to make these irreducible elements as simple and as few in number as possible without having to renounce the adequate representation of any empirical uh, content, what, whatever. So Einstein again says there are two constraints in how we do science. We, we need to get the facts right. We need to get the predictions, the empirical laws right. But we have to do that by a unified system of the world, by a system, a theoretical system, which uses as few principles as possible. Why does he say that? Einstein, you know, as a good Aristotelian, I guess, as a good philosopher, he was thinking that all explanation requires unexplained explainers. Explanation cannot go back forever. You've got to assume something as a starting point and, and try to explain everything on its basis. But the fewer the unexplained explainers are, the fewer the assumptions you make as uh, primitive, uh, the more your understanding of the world is, the, the, the fewer things you take as unexplained themselves. You, you, you take them as unexplained, but you manage to explain as many things as possible. So unification for Einstein is an important element of scientific theorizing. It's an indispensable element. It, it's actually an element which somehow is a mark of truth, 
or of getting closer to the truth, as it were, of scientific theories. So it's really important to, to, to think of his anti-inductivism as something that actually grew stronger and stronger as uh, time went by. And as he himself says, it was basically the path to the general theory of relativity, which uh, Chris spoke about last week, which made him a kind of a convinced anti-inductivist about theories. There was no way simply in which the theory of relativity could be formulated as a generalization from experience. For instance, the generalization uh, of relativity principle to all frames of reference, be they inertial or accelerated frames of reference, is not an inductive leap. Uh, he actually spoke about principles like symmetry and simplicity, which led him to make the generalization of uh, the, the relativity principles to all frames, uh, be they accelerated or inertial. From the theoretical point of view, this theory is not wholly satisfactory, the, spe the special theory of relativity and the early versions of the, of the general theory, because the principle of relativity just formulated favors uniform motion. It is true that no absolute significance must be attached to uniform motion from the physical point of view. The, if it is true that no absolute significance must be attached to uniform motion from the physical point of view, the question arises whether this statement must not also be extended to non-uniform motion. So that's, only, that's not an inductive leap. He says, look, I see no physical reason why we should make uniform motion, that is rectilinear motion with constant velocity, inertial motion, privileged. Why we should put it in a box separately from all other kinds of motion, namely accelerated, accelerated motion. So there's no induction here. There is a generalization, if you like, on the basis of principles of symmetry and simplicity. And that's a beautiful quotation also, which I want to read out, because uh, it shows his anti-inductivism. A clear recognition of the erroneousness of the, of the idea that the postulates of physics are not in the logical sense free inventions of the human mind, that is a clear recognition of the erroneous, erroneousness of inductivism, really only came with a general theory of relativity, which showed that one could take account, could, could take account of the wider range of, of empirical facts, and that too in a more satisfactory and complete manner on a foundation quite different from the Newtonian. So what Einstein says here is this. We've got a beautiful theory, Newton's theory. It explained more or less everything. It had a few little things that needed to, to explain. But in the end, we had to revise the theory radically uh, and to devise a new theory, general theory of relativity about gravity and the structure of space, to account for the phenomena in a more satisfactory and more complete manner. And that's not a, an inductive path. That's a path which is creative, the human mind somehow, the scientist's mind creates hypotheses and principles by means of which it understands and explains the world. Now there is a question here, and it's an important philosophical question that bothered Einstein very much. And these are quotations to show that I don't make it up. And that's a great way to put it, actually. He says, if then it is true that the axiomatic basis of theoretical physics cannot be extracted from experience, but must be freely invented, can we ever hope to find the right way? Why are we free creations anything to do with the world, with, with reality? Nay, more, more has this right way any existence outside, uh, outside our illusions. Can we hope to be guided safely by experience at all when there exist theories which to a large extent do justice to experience without getting to the root of the matter? He says, how can we, how can we make the connection between our theories we devise which are not derived from experience, to the world. How can we say that they're not whimsical, idiosyncratic uh, construction of, of the human mind? Illusions, how do they somehow latch onto the world? And he says, I answer without hesitation that there is, in my opinion, a right way, that this somehow the theory latches onto the world in a right way, and that we are capable of finding it. So it's not that there is just one way, but he was an epistemological optimist, that we can find what this way is. We can find out the truth, if you like, or the right way to uh, connect our theories to the world. But his views were a little bit strange, because he said, our experience hitherto to justify us in believing that nature is the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical ideas. So nature is mathematical in itself, uh, and somehow uh, 
if we can, uh, he says, I'm convinced that we can discover by means of purely mathematical constructions the concepts and the laws connecting them with each other, which furnish the key to the understanding of natural phenomena. Experience may suggest the appropriate mathematical concepts, but they most certainly cannot be deduced from it. Experience remains, of course, the sole criterion of the physical utility of a mathematical construction. So the difference here for Einstein is that the human mind, the scientist mind, by being able to use mathematics somehow can be able to construct all these uh, beautiful mathematical uh, physics, uh, theories in mathematical physics uh, and try to apply them to the world, test them directly by means of experience. But somehow this whole process works because the, the, the structure of the world somehow has mathematics into it. The mathematics somehow latches on to the world by uh, being the realization, by, by nature being the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical ideas. So you need them both actually. You need both the mathematical uh, uh, ingenuity with the Einstein's equations of, of, of gravity and you need something like Eddington's experiment of the bending of the light rays to confirm the theory. But you need them both to have a, a matching between the theory and, and the world. So I'm drawing to a close and now we're going forward to 1952. Uh, Einstein had a lifelong friend, Solovin. I don't quite recall his first name, but he was in extended correspondence with him. And that's a beautiful stamp, and that's a beautiful sketch of something that he actually wrote to, to, to Solovin. And uh, he says something like that. That's a another long quotation, but it's very interesting. The solid line is experience, okay? A are the axioms of the theory. From the axioms of the theory, you derive various uh, lesser axioms or statements, S, S prime, S, S double prime. And then you see this kind of funny arrow, which, not a so straight arrow, which leads from experience somehow to the axioms, okay? And he says, the E's are our data, what we get in experience. The axioms from which we draw our conclusions are indicated by A in this graph. Psychologically, the A depends on the E's, on the, what we learn from experience, but he says there is no logical route leading from the E's to the A's, but only an intuitive connection, which is always returning. That is, there is no empirical path which leads you directly from experience to the axioms. The axioms are what he said, the basic principles of the hypothesis, the free creations of the scientists. Then from these axioms, you derive logically specific statements, uh, uh, and these statements can lay claim to exactness. So, but then he adds a new layer of, of, of uh, significance, because he says the A's are connected to the E's, to what we learn from experience or inexperience, but closer examination how the theory actually connects to experience, to how the world is given to us by means of our senses roughly, shows that this procedure also belongs to the extra logical intuitive sphere, sphere for the relation between the notions so up in S and the immediate experiences are not logical in nature. So he says there is some creativity also involved in moving from what we experience directly from the senses to the empirical laws, the S's, the statements which the theory saves by, being, by deducing them from the basic axioms. But the relation between S's and E's is pragmatically much less certain than the relation between the A's and the A's. Take the notion dog and the corresponding immediate experiences. If such a relationship could not be set up with a high degree of certainty, logical machinery would have no value in the comprehension of reality. So it's not only that there is creativity in the way in which the principles are devised vis-a-vis -vis the various experimental laws, there is creativity in the way we go from immediate experiences, sense data if you like, or whatever is given to us directly by means of the senses, to the empirical structures which the theory should save by means of uh, deductive entailments. Now compare these two graphs now. I think Einstein, uh, Aristotle never drew this, of course, okay? But it's something you can extract out of a famous uh, chapter in posterior analytics, the B19, and, uh, I, and you know, Aristotle never got the chance to be the person of the year or the century or the person of the millennium, but they were actually groping with the same conceptual philosophical problem. And that's a key 
thing in understanding how scientists can engage in, in philosophical activity. And the, the philosophical problem is precisely how these things connect to each other. How experience leads, is connected to the principles by means of which we try to understand the world, how then the principles by means of which we understand the world yield further empirical laws and how these are basically tested. Now for uh, uh, Aristotle, that's induction. But it's most like a placeholder for whatever process is there, by means of which the mind, starting from experience, goes to the principles. Although for Aristotle, induction should start from experience, from particular things. Uh, Einstein insists that this cannot be induction, although somehow it must start from experience. There is no other way to start if you do uh, science. The philosophical problem is not solved. But philosophical problems are not meant to be solved. The philosophical problems are kind of eternal problems. We try somehow to understand the complexity of the problems and make some progress in thinking about possible solutions or ways to address them. What's important, and I'm going to finish with that, is that Einstein offered a solution to Aristotle's philosophical problem in an attempt to understand how the new scientific worldview had come about. This is engaging philosophy at its best. Philosophy is simply not optional for the scientist that aims to engage in the critical contemplation of the theoretical foundations of science. Thank you very much.